Welcome to episode 151 of the Access Noise podcast. I'm Mark Miller. Thanks for listening. In this episode, I speak to British singer-songwriter and musician Andrew Roachford. If you missed the previous episode, I spoke to guitar legend Peter Frampton about his live at the Royal Albert Hall album. So check it out, and if you like the podcast, please subscribe on your favourite listening platform, give us a rating, and leave a comment. Andrew Roachford will be touring the UK in December 2023, titled A Soul Christmas Evening with Roachford. Andrew will perform all his greatest hits from his impressive back catalogue, as well as his favourite Christmas songs. Andrew has released 10 studio albums and several greatest hits collections. He's been sought after as a songwriter by the likes of Michael Jackson, Joss Stone and Shaka Khan. For the past 10 years, Roachford has been part of Mike and the Mechanics, recording with Mike Rutherford's post-Genesis band, playing live with them across the world. In this interview, Andrew talks about the Christmas shows, working with Beverly Knight, his favourite music, songwriting and lots more. So sit back, relax and enjoy the Access Noise podcast with Andrew Roachford. Hi Andrew, welcome to the Access Noise podcast. Yeah, good to be here. It's great to have you. Um, I'd like to go back to the start. Can you remember the first band or artist that made you pay attention to music? First band would have been the Jackson 5 as a kid. Uh, and uh, that was the first thing that hit me, like, wow. <laughs> you know, um, amazing. Top of the pops. In December, you'll be going on a UK tour titled A Soul Christmas Evening with Richard, where you'll perform all your greatest hits as well as your favourite Christmas songs. So how much are you looking forward to the shows and what can fans expect? Well, basically, it's um, going to be... Uh, Primarily, yes, it's going to be a Roachford show, definitely, um, with the added surprise of throwing in a few um, of my, of uh, my favourite soul versions, soul Christmas songs, um, because for me, the feeling of soul is the, the, the most important, the centre of what I do. Uh, and so, yeah, I'm going to be throwing a couple of those in, um, just little surprise snippets here and there. And what will be your favourite Christmas song? Favorite Christmas song? Wow, there's so many. There's so many favorite. I mean, I love "Someday at Christmas" by Stevie Wonder, which I have performed uh, at the Albert Hall last year um, and went down really well. It's a beautiful song and it's got a great message to it. Yeah, I love that song myself. Yeah, yeah. I really enjoyed your last album, "Twice in a Lifetime." Um, oh, and, thanks, man. My, my favorite song on the album was "Are You Satisfied?" What What can you tell me about the inspiration for that song? <sighs> Well, actually, the inspiration for that song was, um, you know, I wanted to do something because you always want to push the boundaries well, for me and, and combine different styles of music. Uh, but I wanted to do something a bit different. And I got the uh, opportunity to work with a writer called Egg White, of all the names, you know, producer. Mm -hmm. um, and he's pretty, he's pretty, ex he's pretty eccentric. He's pretty uh, cool because he, he just allows you to try something different. And so, yeah, I think that's what was behind that. And and the lyric was literally about someone that was kind of a little bit in the shadows and, and, and wanted to be acknowledged by someone a bit more. Yeah, I love it. It's a great, great yes. track. On that album, you also recorded with the Queen of British Soul, Beverly Knight, for the duet, What We Had. So how did that collaboration come around? Well, you know what? It was, it was overdue because we... we bumped into each other over the years and always was like, well, how come you guys haven't worked together? Uh, and eventually, and then, you know, doing this album and then this song came along that I felt needed to be a duet and her name was the name that came up. And uh, thankfully, when I asked her if she would do it, she was like, yeah. Uh, she came to the studio and, of course, you know, sang her heart out and I was like, wow, this is, I'm glad this is happening. It was surreal. And, uh, yeah, it just worked so well. And what did you learn from working with Beverly? Oh, what did I learn? I mean, I, I, I love her perfectionism, her approach, her drive, uh, you know, and, and like me, she's a perfectionist, but really I just like, um, 
the way she just goes at things and doesn't take no for an answer in in anything she does uh 100 you know um but yeah it's just her attitude you know which i loved and do you think beverly nate learned anything from you you're gonna have to ask her that i think uh you know um i i don't set out to sort of go out there and teach anyone anything um i just go out to give 100 percent, and if people learn from that then that's then that's great you know and Beverly Nate also recorded a version of Cuddly Toy. So how much did you enjoy her version? I loved it. It was such a a, a different take, which is good, which is what I like about covers, um, rather than trying to make it sound like a slightly different version original. She just went and took it to Beverly Nightland. And, you know, power to her for that. Uh, hearing it with horns on it, with the brass section, was so cool because I'd never used horns on any of my recordings uh, until my last album. So maybe she had something to do with that. Who knows? Yeah, it's a great version, but it still doesn't beat the original. You know, Cuddly Toy reached number four in the charts in 1988, and it's been a staple on the radio for over three decades. It's your yeah. most well-known song. So how does it feel that you're still talking about that song 30 years later? It's a surreal thing. It's a really surreal thing because, you know, uh, at a, if I had a time machine, <laughs> but, you know, you never... When you're writing that song, I don't think when I'm writing any song that I think they'll be talking about this in 30 years to come and, and beyond. I'm just trying to do something that feels good. Uh, and the fact that when I hear it on the radio, it still happens to it, it still has that freshness about it uh, is is quite amazing. You know, I'm not sure how I did that, but there we go. After the success of Cuddly Toy, you had a run of hit singles um, and Rochard went on to become the biggest sale on British Act on Columbia Records for over a decade. So when you take your mind back, what what do you remember from that time and that period of craziness? Oh, man, so much. You know, I, um, I mean, there was so much great artist uh, to went through that Sony umbrella. Uh, great artist. And, you know, it was just it was just great to be part of that that party because it was it was, you know, Britain, we're going through all different changes at the moment, but there was such a buzz and there was so much uh, resources in the industry at the time. So it was like, it was a, it was a good ride. Yeah, the industry is a completely different landscape now, isn't it? Yeah, uh, you know, when I started out, everything was uh, a centralised chart, uh, only like, you know, one TV show really that was really where you could see what was going, which was really happening. There wasn't, you know, there be there was a tube, but really top of the pops, everything, everyone was focused on the same thing, and it was quite, it was quite exciting. Now it's a very different uh, game. Uh, things have evolved in uh, in whatever way because of primarily the internet, of course, and uh, there's a lot of good that's come out of, of, of that with streaming and with the fact that you can reach your audience in many different ways now. I think that's good for artists who maybe haven't got major record deals. It's not all about having a major deal. You can get to your audience and get, and get heard in, in different platforms, and that's great. Do you prefer the way it is now? I, I prefer aspects of it, but then there's other things that I do, do miss. Um, but... I embrace change and I embrace the fact that things are constantly evolving and as they should, you know, so there's no point sitting there going, oh, well, in my day, because, you know, I'm one of those people that likes to think I have more than one day. <laughs> <laughs> I never, I don't like that phrase, my day, because I think that's, that's really uh, putting yourself in a little short box there, you know. For the past 10 years, you've been part of making the mechanics. Uh, and you've been playing a, a recording and playing live with them across the world. So how, how did that opportunity come around? You know what? That just came about through, I guess, the merits of what I do. I mean, I got the phone call uh, from Mike's people, <laughs> his producer, saying, Mike would like to meet you uh, in lieu of uh, maybe writing something together. He's he's thinking of doing another Mechanics album, but obviously... Uh, Paul Carrick had gone off to do his own thing and uh, Paul Young uh, from Sad Cafe, Paul Young from Manchester, had sadly uh, passed away. So they were looking for, Mike was looking for new, uh, other people to work with. And it just, we got in the studio together and it just worked. There was a chemistry instantly. Uh, and then the next thing I knew, we were doing tours. Uh, and that was like, I think like 12 years ago. And it's still running, which I don't think... 
anyone expected. It just went from strength to strength. And uh, I feel part of the mechanics family. And obviously the mechanics have had a great legacy before I came along. Uh, and I'm glad to be part of that legacy now. You've written so many great songs. And I'm sure there's plenty to come. If, yeah. if people want to understand your music, what are the five songs they should listen to? <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one. Yeah. You know, because now if I name five songs, uh, it's like when see, someone says to me, one of my favorite five films, then I name five. But then after I think, oh, yeah, but there's this one and there's that one. Um, but, you know, I think obviously people know Cuddly Toy, but uh, a lot around the world, Cuddly Toy didn't do, wasn't my biggest track, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, my, one of my best selling albums, I guess, to date has been uh, Permanent Shade of Blue. And the songs off of Permanent Shade of Blue, I think uh, if you haven't heard that album, you need to listen to that album and the Feel album, which have songs like The Way I Feel, Only to Be With You, This Generation, um, Ride the Storm, uh, and the list, the list goes on. Um, there's just so many songs that aren't, it's not just Cuddly Toy, come on. You know? <laughs> oh, I, know, I know well. Yeah, yeah, you know. There's plenty more. Uh, but really, I think um, Permanent Shade of Blue was a big milestone for me as far as I think it established me permanently in in uh, as an album's artist, which is really what I am. I never wanted to just be perceived as a singles artist. I think that's for different kinds of people. I'm a gigging musician, singer, songwriter uh, for now and for always. Do you think there's still a place for albums? That's a brilliant question. Uh, and it's a question that I ask myself from time to time. I do think there is. Like, Baby Nice just put out an album, and I think people uh, take you as an artist more seriously when you do that. And I think for me as an artist, the journey of creating and the challenge of making an album is what keeps me fresh and keeps me at the top of my game. You know, uh, it, the, if I just had to sort of every now and again come up with one song or two songs that were catchy to get on the radio, that's a whole different thing. But actually the, the journey and the challenge of making an album is what for me as an artist keeps me uh, fresh and challenged in a good way. When you're writing songs, what do you think is most important? A great melody or a great lyric? Uh, for me, uh, they both, for, you know, they're both important. Uh, and depending on the track, really, some track, the melody is just saying it all. The melody just has a something about it. There's songs that have such beautiful melodies and great lyrics, but the lyrics are so abstract, you don't even know what they're on about anyway. And if it wasn't for that melody carrying it, uh, dare I say, for example, Why the Shade of Pale, for me, that melody just, it says it all. And then, and, and I do think there's uh, things that melodies can say that words cannot. Melodies can reach places that words cannot. You know, words will always be appealing uh, mostly to the intellect, whereas melodies run deeper and a melody you can communicate with a baby or with an animal with a melody. Yeah, I agree. I mean, you mentioned wider shade appeal. It doesn't really mean anything, but it sounds brilliant. Yeah, I I, I didn't even realise until I got older going, hang on a minute, what is he on about? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and in those days when people took a, a, you know, they experimented with stuff and drugs and stuff, they would write stuff and they didn't even know what it was about. So it wasn't even, it wasn't even like they were trying to be clever. They didn't have a clue. In January 2020, you became a member of the Order of the British Empire. Now, how amazing was that? That was something. That was great. That was such an honour. And, uh, you know, it was such a poignant and important part of my journey, uh, especially for my mum. You know, my mum, uh, for her being um, of Caribbean uh, background and, you know, such a bit that acknowledgement for her was everything. And my brother, who was my manager, who sadly passed away not long after I got that particular accolade, uh, it was an acknowledgement for him uh, to say, you know, OK, uh, I'm being acknowledged in a certain uh, way. Uh, so that was, again, very important in that way. And you're also a patron of the Music Venue Trust. So so what does that entail? What do, what do you have to do? Because I know it's very important to try and keep all these smaller venues 
um, open because you know wh- where's bands or or artists going to you know how they're going to grow and they get on to the bigger stages. I mean, a lot of people cut their teeth in these in the smaller venues, uh, and um, I mean, what what I have to do? I mean, I did a tour uh, earlier this year, um, which was a strictly independent venue tour, uh, and uh, just to talk about um, raising awareness that these venues are out there. And since the pandemic, some of them didn't even make it uh, survive because of funding and lack of, and, you know, because they were empty and stuff. So it's just to try and uh, mention them, give them a mention so that people still know that they exist and go to your local venues and support them so that they stay open because they are so important. Absolutely. Mm. Andrew, you've released 10 studio albums several greatest hits collections. You're a sought-after songwriter but the likes of Michael Jackson, Josh Stone, Shaka Khan. Looking back on your career so far, what's been your highlights? Oh, my Lord. Uh, well, always it will be meeting Michael Jackson. Is Not, not Michael Jackson, sorry. Uh, I didn't get to meet him, actually, because we didn't actually work together. He asked me to do a track, but Stevie Wonder has been is my musical... I have to use the word God because of how he's inspired me, not just musically, but and not just philosophically, but spiritually as well. I mean, you know, these things are all tied in for me. Uh, so actually getting to meet that guy was was something very, very special. Yeah, that would be amazing. And and you, did you write a track for Michael Jackson, did you say? No, I was. Uh, it was kind of mad because I was actually asked. I had I met a guy who was his publisher and said Michael Jackson's a massive fan, uh, and he's asked me to, uh, to have a chat with you. And uh, I don't even think I believed at the time. I was really a lot younger. I was in my mid twenties, and I was just like, "What?" <laughs> <You know? laughs> and he said, that, "You know, you remind him of uh, Sly and the Family Stone," and it was a band that I was and still am so hugely into. So I, I couldn't believe it, you know. Um, but I was obviously uh, there wasn't a lot of time to get something together because he was in that closing period of the, uh, I think, the bad album. I mean, and I never actually did it, but I was really chuffed that I was on his radar. I was just like, really, <laughs> you know? Uh, and it's still a bit sort of surreal. And then later on, I met some of the other Jacksons, and I realised that, that that it was true. Yeah. Well, wow, amazing. Yeah, yeah. Just a few more, Andrew. I'd like to ask my guests the following questions. If you could go back and relive one musical moment from your career, what would it be? Relive? Um, I mean, uh, I'm an Aquarian, you know, we're quite uh, typically forward looking. So I've never really done the go, go back thing, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, but seeing as you put me on the spot, go back. And I quite liked when I did the gig. Uh, at Wembley Stadium opening for In Excess. That was a very, and for a lot of people, that was a very, very incredible moment. Yeah, I mean, that that's that was the axe tour at Wembley Stadium. That, that was legendary. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And actually, you know, walking on and there was like, it was packed, you know. Um, and apparently, and you know, and Elton John was in the audience and he was, he was just raving and then he became a fan from that day on. So there we go. Wow. For us music fans, music is the soundtrack to our memories. What song or album, when you listen to it, brings back the best memories for you? Uh, Exodus, Bob Marley, I think. Um, uh, it reminds me of my family going to... I have family in Sweden, of all places. And uh, when when I went out, that was actually the album that was released. I went out with my mum and my brother, and couldn't, me and my brother just couldn't stop playing that record. Um, it was like... It was my it was my life it was our life at the time you know um every song on the exodus album was a winner yeah and it still stands up now yeah and just seeing i remember because i had had it on vinyl and it was a beautiful gold uh cover and they'd really done a lot of work into making that special vinyl album and wow you know still amazing andrew you've been famous for a long time now <laughs> what's the what's the stupidest thing you've ever bought Bought. Uh, oh, man, there's been a lot of those. Uh, Stupidest thing I've ever bought. <laughs> <laughs> well, now you put me on the spot because, I mean, you know, oh, my God. Uh, I remember uh, 
we it might, it's a crazy story but in the band uh for energy because my show is always about energy and I'm, I'm not you know I've not been into drugs I'm not really a druggy type person but Royal Jelly was on Vogue at some point in the 90s early 90s late 80s and I thought right that's the way forward and I remember buying like a year's supply of it something ridiculous and that was the silliest thing I ever did I think because <laughs> it cost me a lot of money just like crates and crates of Royal Jelly can you believe that what is, what's, what is Royal Jelly Okay, so it's like a, uh, it's from honey, but it's uh, an it's a extract from the the pollen or the, or the bees when they pollinate and they make this stuff that's like a, comes from the honeycomb or something. But apparently, it's very very rich, it, nutrient rich, and uh, that's how I used to get my high and my band. So it was the funniest thing, and it was really expensive at the time because people thought it was a elixir and it was like you know and so i immediately went out and bought like loads and loads like a lifetime supply and had to get rid of half of it you know <laughs> yeah on the clean bee you know so it's got to be good <laughs> finally andrew what are you most grateful for for being able to do what you do every day what am i most grateful for well that's kind of the question and the answer you know uh i'm grateful to have the ability to sort of get up in the morning and create something new. Uh, I don't know how I do it, but I can, because someone asked me, now, how do you, how do you just get something out of thin air, like a melody or something that, and I, and I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how I do it, but I very much appreciate that. I, and it's a, it's a thing that I'm, you know, because obviously you being famous and those things is great. And, and, but that can, you know, that, that peaks and troughs as it does. And it's, you know, if that was what was important to me, I, I would be really, you know, people get really depressed when they're not as famous as they want to be and blah, blah, blah. But I just can get up and make a tune. And I love that. Amazing. Amazing. Thanks, man. So, Andrew, is there anything else you would like to mention before we wrap up? Anything else coming up? Musical projects? You know, we've got the tour coming up. Anything else? Well, you know, I've been asked, as you asked me about how important still you know, making albums are, and at some point there will be another album. There's going to be new material, of course, uh, um, some new material this year, but I'm going to be definitely making another album. Uh, hopefully I always will be, uh, as my uh, hero has always made it right up until that was it, you know. So, yeah, look out for that. Brilliant, brilliant. Look forward to it. Yeah. Thanks, man. Well, Andrew, that was amazing. I really, really enjoyed that. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Yeah. Hey, you man, and uh, good to talk to you. Uh, and hopefully, are you in? Are you in Ireland? And are you in Ireland at the moment? Belfast. In Belfast, you see, that's uh, uh, somewhere which I don't get to, uh, or I haven't played enough. You know, I was in Belfast earlier this year filming a Celebrity Mastermind. So there's that to look out for uh, oh. uh, around. I think it's going to be around later in the year anyway. So look out for that. That was done in Belfast. Well, well, I'll have to watch that. But you definitely yeah. have to get the Belfast <laughs> night that you said it. You have, you have the, there's plenty of great venues for the, you know, you could play. Yeah, I, I played there with Mike and Mechanics a couple of times and I loved it. I played in a place that I don't know the name of it. I can't remember, but I remember it was actually a, a working boxing ring. Right. And, uh, that was amazing because Belfast has just got a, an energy and an atmosphere about it. And being a big um, Thin Lizzy fan, as I have always been growing up with that, uh, playing with Northern Ireland, uh, and I know they're Dublin boys as well, but just being in, in Ireland, just it is a, there's a history that it's great to be part of that, to be out there. Well, then you must come. Yeah. You definitely you must come. Well, do. Okay, well, Andrew, again, Thanks very much for, for doing this here. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you. And uh, I wish you all the best with the upcoming shows. And I look forward to new music from you. Cheers, man. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Have a good day. Ciao, man. Bye. Bye-bye.